Thank you. That was way too long of an intro for anyone, so I apologize. Maybe it feels worse when you're actually listening to your own introduction. So I was charged uh, with coming to talk to you a little bit about the program that I've built at the University of Guelph and how we got to that place and what some of those considerations were and some of my own. I don't just take my inspiration from the experience that I've had in academia. I also worked for government for a little while, so maybe some connect connections with Kentucky. That's where I first crossed paths with Bob Coleman. Um, so there's a definitely an Alberta connection. I'm also the academic sister to doc Dr. Christine Urschel. She was the junior PhD in the laboratory when I was the senior PhD. So I come from the swine industry originally um, and I'm very passionate generally about agriculture. And where do the horses come in? Well, for those of you who are involved in horses at all, I found out whatever university I've ever gone to, when people find out that I ride horses, then they just think that I can teach anything in the horse curriculum as well. I try to keep them fairly focused on nutrition for the most part uh, at the University of Guelph. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this, how this entire experience brought me to my program at Guelph. And I do give a lot of credit as well to um, the training that I received at Procter & Gamble outside of pet care, but more holistically in research and development and collaboration. And so that's where I've gotten quite a bit of my inspiration around collaborative teams and leadership in particular. So why do we want to research animals? Well. Probably not surprising to anybody in this room, we have been in a committed relationship for a very long time. And these are just some clips that uh, between the value of dogs, cats, and horses in our society, how we've continued to evolve our use of each one of the, those species, and how it's evolved to today, where especially with dogs and cats, and I argue horses, and I'm going to argue as well in some other cases, what we're seeing in dogs, cats, and horses and the way that society feels about them, they're going to start to now look at chickens because we see chickens going into the backyard. We've got pigs that are pets. This is going to start to evolve a lot more and as an entire animal agricultural uh, sector, we need to be aware about these changing societal values and more specifically the changing societal values in North America where Canada and the US share a lot of these same values and experiences and we are different different uh, than uh, other experiences if you go globally that I'll might mention a little bit through my talk. So um, I am going to first uh, alert you to this little uh, paper that I think is really interesting as the first paper that I saw a physiological basis for why dogs change our lives. And what this study demonstrated that dog owners, wherever they are in the world, share a rare bacteria, and I'm not a microbiologist, so the microbiologists will know this better, but they share a rare bacteria that is not present in people who don't own dogs or families who don't own dogs. So there's something that's uniquely similar among all dog owners and that is because of the presence of dog who also um, uh, possesses that same bacteria. So we don't just share a house with them, we share a microbiome with them to a certain extent as well, which isn't surprising because we're living in the same environments. That's not my music though. <laughs> Sounds really great though. Um, now, not surprising, this is uh, on, on the two panels, we have the mental health benefits that Habri posts on their website about the benefit of dog ownership. And they really focus on stress, uh, depression, loneliness, um, I, and then on uh, long-term help with those animals and health challenges. They talk also about dogs in uh, improving immune function. And these are all underpinned by science that's demonstrated that pet owners uh, tend to 
uh, have greater levels of physical activity. I would say this is a lot more predominant when we start to factor horses in. Um, we have a lot more interaction with horses. There's also a physical component to us more so with horses. But just the presence of dogs that aren't working in the household increases physical activity of their owners when they're invested. My lab has gone on to do some global surveys that demonstrate that there are also global differences in dog ownership and level of activity. And uh, what was really interesting is that Germans tend to be highly, highly active with their dogs, up to 90 minutes a day, um, participating in physical activity with their dog. And then in North America, we tend to, we tend to be lower than uh, the Germans in particular. Um, we also see the effects of dogs on things like systolic blood pressure and uh, in cholesterol and triglyceride levels. Um, of course, that's confounded data though, because I just told you that people who own animals tend to exercise more and there's benefits of exercise on these as well. So there's an opportunity to kind of uh, delineate these effects and start to understand the unique role that the possession of pets have on our systemic health, specifically around comorbidities that we a lot of, we have a lot of in North America, and I do believe you have a diabetes center as well. So when we talk about glucose control, and uh, I is not part of this talk, but for those of you who, who don't appreciate that dogs can also detect things like high glucose. There are people training them to detect cancer in blood samples at uh, Penn State. Um, in um, France, they're teaching dogs to detect uh, viruses detect cancer without a blood sample. So literally walking up to you and being able to signal that you are uh, have a cancer burden. So they are very valuable when we think about our own health care as well. And we have to think about what the value is to them and the relationship that we have that promotes that interest of them in helping to maintain our health in a more detection-based uh, method. Uh, we know that they improve uh, immune function as well. There is, uh, there's literature to suggest that the ownership of a dog helps cancer or helps heart attack survivors uh, be more successful post um, uh, intervention, health intervention after a heart attack as well as an example. And then probably most importantly and what we see a lot in pop culture literature is the effects of dogs in particular on decreasing increasing mental stress um, and feelings of hopelessness and depression and increasing self-esteem. And this goes across all age categories. And uh, for those of us who have families um, and have dogs and or cats, uh, I don't know how your children interact with them, but owning dogs and cats as well, uh, those dogs and cats have a unique relationship with the children in our families. And so for example, um, children might talk to dogs in their household or cats in their household when they refuse to talk to their parents or their siblings. And that's uh, a unique friendship uh, that helps that child improve their self-esteem. And then of course, if you improve mental health, we're all in education that also improves your ability to learn uh, as well, because it's really hard to learn if you're not happy and you're not confident, right? So there's also a benefit to us. And I don't know what you do at the University of Kentucky in terms of that, but uh, we're uh, cruising and uh, just past midterms now. And at midterms, we have a very structured uh, program at Guelph where we have the ability to come and spend time with service dogs who are trained to do accompaniment. And it's just a timeout. So you need a timeout, you're getting anxious studying, or you have a really big exam tomorrow, come and spend some time with these service dogs. I run a cat colony, um, and uh, I can tell you that I have a lot of undergrads who volunteer in that, and part of the reason they volunteer is just to take a break from what they're doing every day, and they feel better. The cats are really um, very, very, very friendly, really enjoy their two hours of socialization a day, um, and so they're charged to cuddle with the cats, touch every cat, and this is also really beneficial for the humans. Now, 
as I start to get into the big why, why we should be doing, and I'm going to talk about research and teaching um, around all the animal biosciences, really. And the reason also is I'm a Gen Xer. I just turned 50. Um, and the approach that I have and the relationships that I have with the animals around me are different than the relationships that, for example, my graduate students have with their animals. And our societal relationship is different from that, those entire age categories. And so now, today's in our Gen Zs and our late millennials, definitely many of them consider them pet, pet parents. And I have a lot of students who have literally told me that they do not plan to have a family, they plan to get married and have a partner, but they're just going to have pets instead of children. And so now we have a lot of people that are choosing to not have children and to have pets, and we're really elevating the role of pets in the household. So like I mentioned earlier, what we know now about North American society is they consider dogs, cats, and horses when you talk to people. If they own dogs, cats, and horses, and you say describe your family, they include their pets in their family. Horses are in or out sometimes, but dogs and cats are always in the description of the family. I mentioned intermediate animals here. Uh, rabbits, I think, are about to move quite permanently into the family category if you start looking around in the rabbit literature. And uh, I do have uh, the fortune or the misfortune of being the section editor for Companion Animal in the Journal of Animal Science. And somehow, rabbits just fell into what I have to handle. But what's really traumatizing for me is I'm getting meat rabbit work from Asia, and I don't know how to position that in a North American journal uh, very well because rabbits are moving into that family zone, and that doesn't exactly jive with what we're doing in North America versus the rest of the world. But I have a little bit of a moral conundrum about that too because a lot of the world raises rabbits to eat, and we're animal scientists, and so I have a little bit of a tension point here that I'm trying to make sure that we get really good rabbit research and that we are thinking about the welfare of those meat rabbits in research is how I've kind of framed it right now. And then we have at the bottom the suitables uh, for consumption for the most part, but as most of you are aware as well, we're seeing a shift and we're seeing a greater percentage of people in our population choosing to be flexitarians, vegetarians, or vegans as well. So we have to be aware that as this changes, so do the patterns of the consumption of the foods that they change which is also part of what we all work on as well. So we have a very interesting role when we start to think about this holistically. So what's the best thing that we can do to support them? Well, I think, first of all, we have a dearth of data in companion animals if we compare them to example for agricultural animals. Maybe a bit more when we look at human animal bond, but certainly less when we look at behavior, nutrition, physiology, genetics, those, all the classic animal science domains, we are under indexed in companion animal research on those animals, or on companion animal versus all of the animals together. So I think we also need a lot more species specific data. A cat and a dog is not a horse. A horse is not a chicken. We have different relationships. They have different behavior repertoires. They have different uh, metabolic idiosyncrasies, which means they need different diets. So we have a whole group of very unique animals here. And so we need to do research and gain data um, on the human-animal interaction. I'm using interaction rather than bond here. Uh, on genetic management. So I'm sure you are all aware that while there are some really great dog breeders out there, the vast majority of cats would 
not be purpose bred as an example. Um, so we have dog breeders that are breeding specific breeds of dogs, but we have a tremendous amount of feral dogs coming into our, uh, uh, into our adoption systems as well. Uh, so feral or dogs that, um, uh, wild is the wrong word, feral being domestic in, in the wild, but we bring them down from, uh, I, I think, have you passed laws yet on bringing them in from other countries? Because we've passed those in Canada because we were getting quite a few. Um, what's that? What dogs? Like dogs from the streets of India, dogs from the Dominican. But, but what kind of laws? As in, like, they have to be health checked prior to getting on a plane and being deposited in our countries because of zoonotic potential. Yeah, so we're starting, I think we're getting some controlled public health that way, but the dogs that we're seeing that are coming in that are feral or from, for us, it's from Northern, on, uh, from Northern Canada. Um, uh, the indigenous in Canada also don't believe in dog ownership, so uh, they're free living on most of our uh, reserves uh, as well. So we're seeing a lot of dogs come into humane societies that way as well. Um, but we need to think about genetic management of all of our dogs, whether these are purpose bred or whether we're looking at it holistically on a North American scale. Um, we need basic physiological and behavior knowledge. That's just basic. That's not, it, it's just understanding very simple processes. For me as a nutritionist, it means doing things like nutrient requirements. I'm a nutrient requirement girl, and when I started doing amino acid requirements in dogs, there were a litany of people who said, oh, we know where the, what the requirements are. Look in the NRC. There are maybe one, two per amino acid study, and they were all done on either beagles or mixed hounds, we don't have a really good working idea about the nutrient requirements and the nutrient interactions in some of these cases. Uh, but there was a little bit of a kerfuffle in 2018 um, around uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and grain-free diets. And uh, I don't think that the request to do research in dogs has stopped since that day. Um, and I think most of us who are doing companion animal have a, a long list. So we need some more of that. We also need environmental management. There's very few people that are talking about how you manage your dog or cat in a house. We have a lot of products that are provided, but we're not telling pet owners how to use those products. We're not telling them when to use those products. We're not telling them where to use those products or who should be using those products with their dog or cat. The classic that I love is the example of there's, there is information, but it's not great at pet stores. You get a new cat, you go in, you get all the supplies, and then I'm gonna put the litter box in an area where I don't even see it. Oh, and there's probably some loud noise around it too. You know, w would you like to go into the bathroom and have something banging beside you while you're, you're going to the bathroom and then nobody ever flushes the toilet or once in a while they flush the toilet? Right, so you have to talk about management of litter as an example with cat owners because man management of litter is really important for the onset of urinary tract disease which can then lead to other diseases. Um, and then my area where I'm gonna kind of uh, talk about when we talk about a program is nutritional management of healthy animals and in the case of my collaborations, um, some therapeutic and nutrition as well. So looking at nutrition um, in disease states. So why should we do this and how are we going to do it? So I work on nutrition. I'm gonna give you the nutrition perspective. But the global pet care market, that includes things like litters, litter and toys, as well as food, uh, is 261 billion in 2022. And it, that's up from 245 in, tw in 2021. So the pet care industry is considered to be recession proof. It continues to grow even as things contract. We know that people will opt to continue to feed their dogs and cats and will make other choices to cut spending on their family. Not on, not on necessities, but if they're not going to go to an additional movie a week, 
because they have to buy food and it's really close, they're gonna choose to buy the food and keep the pet. They're gonna take something away from themselves as an example. It's also expected that pet Gary is gonna to continue to grow at about 6.1 compounded annual growth rate. And that means in 2027 that this market is gonna be worth about $350 billion globally. And the United States is, owns the vast majority of manufacturing of pet care products. So it's very strategically placed to take advantage of the companies that are manufacturing all of these pet products. And not surprising to you, I ripped this off of the AFIA website, but when we think about food as well, it's really important to remember that not just pet food, but animal food in general uh, drives agriculture and drives the economy. So as we all talk about shifting things, uh, around in terms of our food systems, let's remember that one of the things that it also helps is it also helps to support our economy. And uh, just in terms of not just the total sales, but how, how many jobs are uh, involved with that, how many taxes are paid because of that, there's a lot of money generation that comes back to the uh, animal feed and food markets. And so when we look at pets today, this is what I uh, tend to uh, spend a lot of time rolling around in. Our marketplace looks like a very humanized marketplace when we're looking at pet products and especially um, those that are for the family member. So there are different kinds of brands. I also work with, with mushers, uh, so people who own sled dogs and race them. They have a completely different food philosophy. It's almost impossible to get these guys to use kibble. Um, and you, there's a lot of flexibility that you have to make and you have to really understand what their belief sets are. But in general, when we're looking at the vast majority of the pet food market, it is resolve, revolving around consumer demand and that consumer demand looks exactly like the demand in the human food market. Okay, so what we see a lot is we see ingredient comparisons. So the grain-free market arised because people started removing grains from their own diets and then questioned the presence of grains in their pets' diets. That's how the grain-free market got so big so quickly as one example of an ingredient-based um, uh, consumer demands um, uh, philosophy. We also see a question about nutrients. Um, and so they will start to ask for nutraceuticals that are being marketed in the human industry and they'll start giving it to their dogs and cats and uh, horses are a whole different kettle of worms when you call, come to settle supplements because they rely so heavily on supplements. So there's a ton of equine supplements on the market as well. Um, and then uh, around feeding philosophy, I think is probably the biggest one. And that really means, what are you feeding? Are you feeding what I call brown and round? So the classical kibble, if you're, it's all about uh, consistency and safety, you're gonna choose kibble. I'm super busy, I still feed kibble. Um, do I see value in other approaches? Absolutely I do. And so that's where these other approaches come from, um, like these, these uh, classical kind of meat looking, so more like a liverwurst. Um, uh, kind of uh, kind of food. We of course have dehydrated foods, uh, but you do need a dehydrator. You've got raw foods. You've got ecological feeding. The it, it goes on and on, and then there's all the flex between those. So we see a ton of people that are using multiple formats, multiple supplements. It gets quite quite um, uh, variable in the marketplace. We also see this, this thing where if, if you watch any of the commercials on pet foods and you look at what it looks like, I mean, I think I could put some of this out at a party and people would eat it and not even notice that they were eating pet food. I could say that we're having chicken stew tonight and instead of actually making stew, I might as well just go out and get some dog food, slap it into a pot and I'm pretty sure everybody again is going to eat it. We have this much of a humanization in our uh, dog and cat foods. But all of this, is under a tremendous amount of regular, regulatory constraints and there's further demand to increase the regulation on pet. 
Um, it, is, it is really hard, as an example, to get a new ingredient through FDA and then get an ingredient definition of AFCO, and now all of that regulation is changing as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what the how the speed of in ingredient approval, I'm hopeful that it's going to get better, not slower. I don't know if it could get slower. Um, so it'll be, it'll be very uh, interesting to see how regulatory constraints change. The other thing is as mass exporting countries, both Canada and the US, we not only have to meet our regulations within our country, we have to meet everybody else's regulations as well. And that means we need to know those markets as well as we know our market. So this might be the biggest market in the world, but there are tons of markets that are developing rapidly and ours is developing less rapidly. So we need to be aware of how people think about their animals globally, how people think about their food globally, and how that dictates their governmental policies and regulations to get foods and feeds into those countries. So overall, really, when I think about my goal of innovation and advancement of equine, canine, and feline health and well-being is how I kind of frame it, it's to improve the health and well-being of companion animals by providing the best care available using a data-informed approach, but with consideration of the physiological needs and the opinions of our society. So I spend a lot of time trying to do research in, in dogs and cats, and it is not easy. And I have to have a lot of conversations, and I have to do a lot of persuasion that we can do and have done a lot of the things that we do. And so I generally uh, follow kind of this, this idea. I told you that we don't have a lot of information in PET, so we're still really in the, in, in the data and the information um, uh, uh, generation part of this, this schematic. We're moving into a better set of uh, knowledge, uh, but we certainly haven't really hit any wisdom, I think, as we think about nutrition in, dog and, in dogs and cats. We haven't gotten to this uh, really wisdom level with them yet. So to put together my program, um, and this was really inspired by my time in industry, we were extremely multidisciplined when I worked at P&G Pet Care in particular, but not only were we multidisciplined within the pet care division, we were multidisciplined within Procter & Gamble One Health. And so when I think about diverse teams for pet, uh, pet products, um, you know, I'm looking for perspectives from human nutrition and dietitians have exceptional uh, level of understanding to understand how people think about their food today, what kind of myths and truths exist with humans. They're gonna have a very interesting perspective when you bring them into either dog or cat or horse nutrition. Um, of course, we need a veterinary uh, medicine perspec uh, perspective as well, and they come at it wanting to know how nutrition is going to affect the longevity and the progression of disease in their animals. Obviously, we need food scientists and chemical engineers as well. And if there was one area that I wished I had have spent more time learning about as a nutritionist, it would hands down be in the food science and the chemical engineering realms. We also need a really good toxicologist on board, and that's because, especially I mentioned, we're going to move a lot from animal proteins into plant proteins, and I always have to remind the people who are hardcore plant people that making plant-based diets, in a lot of respects, there can be more safety issues with the plant-based you don't get rid of your anti-nutritional factors. You store it for too long and they grow, grow mold and produce mycotoxins. These are food safety issues that most of our society doesn't think about that are there with plants and to a bit of a lesser extent with animal-based uh, products. So we need good toxicologists with really good understandings of the toxic compounds found in especially the novel ingredients that we're researching and putting into the market. Um, I'm going to come up to the, the top here. We need animal behaviorists as well. That's not just on the research side. It also comes on the application side, and it also comes on the marketing and advertising slide, side. It is a really good idea when you're putting a dog or a cat or a horse on the front of a product that you make sure that that picture 
is what resonates with cons what consumers want to see out of those animals, right? They don't want to see an animal that's suggesting that they're stressed or anxious or unhappy as the very first kind of point of entry, okay? So we need behaviorists along the way, we need ethicists along the way because they're gonna tell us as well about how to consider the use of dogs and cats and horses uh, in society in general. We need immunologists as well, of course, that kind of uh, ladders a little bit into veterinary medicine, but we need to understand how the foods that we're uh, innovating can improve or maintain uh, immune status in these animals in the long term, which also means that we need to work with veterinarians to communicate that. And then last but not least, we uh, marketing and advertising, this sounds really funny, uh, but if you, the, the hardest thing that I had to learn in industry was you can have a really like the most brilliant idea. You can produce the best product in the world, but if you don't have someone who can sell that product and get it into the people's hands who need it, it doesn't matter. Right? So having a really good working relationship, and believe me, it's really hard to work with marketing. Um, I hope there's no marketers in the room because I'm going to tell you the it's really hard as a scientist too, and especially a PhD scientist to sometimes work with marketers because we think very differently. And we can't think uh, as broadly and as, oh, they just think a lot differently. So once a marketer asked me, they were putting together a schematic, and they literally asked me how many wings a chicken has. And I didn't even really know how to respond to that question because I thought that most people understood that chickens were birds and that birds have two wings like we have two arms but nevertheless they're an interesting group of people be patient explain a lot and bring it down that's also really really hard uh, for scientists so that means that your scientific communication and your marketing have to complement each other but one thing that I am really adamant about, I talked to, I'm telling you about all the expertise that you need, but there's never been an advancement in the world that wasn't done better as more than one person having an idea. It's always better when we collaborate. And so when I went to Guelph, uh, I came about five years after the Ontario Veterinary College hired Dr. Adroni Verbrugge. And she's a clinical nutritionist, so she's a veterinarian and clinical nutritionist. And she had come to work in the clinical nutrition uh, division as part of clinical sciences. She sees and she takes all the hospital's nutrition requests, okay? That's largely what she was working on, and she was charged to start an obesity clinic. So then I showed up, and I'll be honest, it wasn't particularly easy at the beginning. It, She's also Belgian. I'm Canadian. She's a little bit more like the Dutch. It's good that I'm a really blunt Canadian because uh, that worked out really well. I didn't say sorry very much, and she really tended to appreciate that a lot. Um, over the years and after we've gotten through our attention points, we're an extremely strong team. Um, and despite being in the veterinary college and the agricultural college, which sometimes can have some tensions among them in a university, uh, we've uh, created a really great uh, collaborative program together, largely around our center plexus's methyl metabolism and uh, energy metabolism. And so she uses my cat colony quite a bit, but she's got a lot of expertise in, um, in metabolomics uh, that's quite valuable to me uh, as well. And so we have an extremely strong relationship, which would be evident uh, if, you look up my, uh, if you look up my publication record. Um, but she helped me do a little bit more clinical nutrition. We had a lot of overlap already. And my program is way, way bigger than that. So buckle up, because I'm going to show this is going to be a really busy slide, but I'm going to show you the, the program that I built. OK. I told you there was going to be a lot on this slide, right? So this is also my career progression. And I like to show this because I think that networks are incredibly important. And trust and relationships, even if you're a scientific researcher, 
um, really can enhance a program. In dog and cat nutrition specifically, I find a little bit less in some of the horse nutrition that I work, but relationships are important in the research world in dog and cat nutrition because you will no doubt get a multidisciplinary re request. It's not just, nobody's gonna just let me do energy and protein metabolism. They wanna know if I can look at, um, so my PhD student, Taylor Richards, is gonna talk about some work that we've done in oil supplementation to dogs and horses. And I wasn't a fatty acid expert. And you need people that are experts in the area, as an example. That's another nutrition area. But I also need a lot of other experts. And so I have slowly gained all these collaborators and mentors along the way um, from my time at the U of A uh, through to coming to my postdoc starting at IAMS. So this group here is IAMS and P&G, except for Fahey. And, and I did meet Candace Crony, who's a faculty member at Purdue at Mars and P&G Pet Care. Um, and that's where I first met uh, George as well, but he's come in more as a, as a mentor over the years. Now, when I came back to Guelph, I told you I already st I started with really collaborating with Adroni Verbrugge. Uh, my background being energy and uh, protein and amino acid metabolism and coming from the swine industry, um, our poultry nutritionist Elijah Chiaria and our swine nutritionist Leanne Huber, we're like, yo, over here, we used to work together, come and, come and serve on committees. And so I really collaborated a lot with them and I have no idea why, but I actually put in a swine grant as one of the first grants that I got at Guelph. And I put that together in collaboration with Dr. Dan Columbus, who's a scientist at Prairie Swine and, and adjunct at the University of Saskatchewan. And that's really uh, a lot of how I got started. But then I started branching out and going only to dog, cat, and horse. And today, my program now spans the world in terms of collaborators, but multiple buckets. And so my protein quality bucket We've done amino acid requirements. We've pulled consumers. We've worked on digestibility assays. We've cleared new protein ingredients. And I work with agricultural economists. I work with Wageningen University. I work with Crystal Levesque um, from South Dakota State and Glenda Courtney Martin from the University of Toronto. And she's a pediatrician. So I bring her in to give me perspectives on the protein quality work because she's working on protein quality in humans. And so she's my cross-disciplinary um, uh, uh, kind of balance there. And then uh, Chris Marinangeli, I, because of the relationships that we first made around screening pulse ingredients around this whole FDA DCM thing, um, now he works, um, he, he looks for people to support research on alternative proteins. And he is this huge champion for me in the federal government, which is amazing when you have a federal government employee that is championing your work um, in, at the federal government level. I also work a little bit in cardiac health, terrifying to me a little bit, but I have a veterinary cardiologist, Sherry Rahab, who I work with, and then that overlaps with work that we've done on circadian uh, rhythm in dogs uh, with Dr. Tammy Martino. Lipid metabolism, I have, it is an opportunity to come full circle. So uh, David Ma and Lindsay Robinson are fatty acid experts in human nutrition. And Luciano Trevisan is a fatty acid expert in veterinary nutrition located in Brazil. So trying to span multiple geographical areas there again. Of course, not surprisingly, any gut health work I'm doing in dogs and cats, I just phoned Kelly Swanson at the University of Illinois, because who else would you phone if you were doing the microbiome? Maybe Jan Sadowski, uh, but Kelly uh, is who I work with. Uh, Dr. Mike Steele, who anybody who's a dairy nutritionist uh, will know him well. Um, and Neil Carroll, because gut health is the plexus with immunology as well, and comes, comes in there. We also have buckets where we look at behavior and welfare, and I work with a veterinarian uh, behaviorist, Alexander Harlander. Uh, she's in my department. She's a, she looks at high, their, high, high feather pecking chickens and the serotonergic system. 
and it was adorable because she's Austri uh, she's Austrian, and her I saw it on her very first. Um, this is, by the way, I'm about to tell a dirty joke, so cover your ears if you can't handle it. They're all European, and they referred to the high feather pecking um, chickens for this entire meeting as the peckers. And um, I laughed uh, many times during the meeting and then had to explain to her <laughs> what that means in North America. And she is extremely proper as an Austrian and was horrified at what had been happening because she said she'd been talking about that like that for about six months before I came. And I was just amazed that no one had laughed out loud or told her what the word meant. <laughs> so she's lovely. Um, love her a lot. And then Candace Crony, who's at Purdue and is probably one of the leading behavioral scientists in uh, canine welfare and behavior, um, who I work with as well on both cat and dog. Then when I go into energy metabolism is really when I started getting a lot more people in mathematical modeling. And so this is Jen Ellis and Etienne Laboussier at INRA, and they bring in the hardcore mathematical modeling into a lot of my energy metabolism work. Uh, so that's quite beneficial. And uh, Ryan Dilger has come on board recently and we started looking at polyphenols um, in energy metabolism as well. And then I have my disruption category, which I think is the most fun. So this is a computer scientist, Dan Gillis, and we are getting exceptionally close to producing a free, completely accessible online dog and cat food formulation tool. And uh, we are going to then move to having a veterinary only access tool and a public tool because the public tools are out there. Okay, so we wanted to do it better than everyone else is doing it, but we knew we had to do it by making it freely accessible or somebody's just gonna search homemade dog diet and get rice and ground beef as what they're going to do, right? So he's my one uh, disruptor. Obviously, I don't know how to take a software program and put it on the internet. That was far beyond my capability. And uh, then my colleague Guido Bosch, uh, Aveg Vakenigen, who is over here as well, along with Wouter Hendricks in the protein category. But he is a fascinating thinker. And he convinced me a little while ago to try feeding mice to our cat colony. And I was like, never going to happen. They've never had mice. They're purpose-bred cats. They're six years old. They're not going to eat them, Hito. They're never going to do it. They all ate dead mice within two days of offerings. Super fascinating. And to traumatize you even more, I'm not gonna tell you the results of the experiment because we did behavior and we did energy expenditure and we compared um, eating dead mice to raw food, to canned food, to extruded food. But the results were so compelling, I decided to start giving my own cats at home dead mice a couple times a week. I'm only allowed to do it in the basement, and I'm supposed to watch them until they finish it because they're, I am not allowed for any dead mice to be found in the house. Um, <laughs> but they eat them within minutes. They play with them a little bit, and then whoop, down the hatch. And uh, they're very happy that way. So he does really bizarre things like this. At ASAS this year, he uh, did mathematical, some mathematical modelers to show that uh, street dogs, uh, about 25% of their diet is comprised of uh, human feces, which is super, super gross. Um, so he brings really interesting ideas in. So working on e any of these buckets, and they're all super, super diverse buckets, we follow the same pattern, and this is the scientific method, peppered in with a little bit of communication, right? So we identify these high-level high technical problems, and we kind of filter around in here with how we're gonna do it. The reason that we have to have a lot of conversations with companion animals is we need to be careful about what we research in companion animals, and we need to make sure that it's accepted by society uh, so it's a very, very important consideration when you're doing research in dogs and cats. And I probably now, I own, my dog research is only in client-owned dogs and sporting dogs. I, I 
no longer have a colony. And if you want to talk to me afterwards about all the reasons why, I also know that Dr. Herman had a colony as well. I'm sure we have many of the same reasons why we didn't feel comfortable with the colony. Uh, but we have to be very careful about doing research in dogs and cats. So we spend a lot of time before we even write a grant or talk to anybody kind of filtering her around in here. Once we refine the, pro the, the problem, yeah, we go and do what all academics do. Um, we're going to design a study. We're going to write a grant. Um, once we get the grant, we're going to get the approval for the study. We're going to take that out. After we finish all those studies, what do we all do? We all write scientific manuscripts. But what's really, really, really important in the pet food industry, if you're doing research, is it has to be translatable. And so I did not, I, uh, when I got involved in the DCM saga, I was claiming all my conflicts of interest because everyone was screaming them at me. Um, and in about the last two years, so after I went on sabbatical to the Netherlands, I started really challenging people that I don't have a conflict of interest. I'm not getting paid to skew results. I'm not making money on the commercial benefit that the companies that approach me with. They come to me because I bring transparency to the research that they want. I help to support their go-to-market strategy. We don't have a conflict of interest. We have a mutual interest. And so it's very important to work with the sector as you're working through these problems. So I was going to give you a couple examples uh, from preclinical proof of concept all the way to post-marketing work that we've done. So I changed the preclinical proof of concept and really kind of called this method development and validation. And an example of this that I applied was when I first started doing isotope dilution studies to quantify amino acid requirements. We did all the validation and calibration work uh, for moving the indicator amino acid oxidation technique uh, over to dogs from other animals. And if you're familiar with isotope dilution uh, methods, there are kind of some standard things that you're, you're going to work through to make sure that you're getting valid results. Uh, from there, you want to move to the clinical proof of concept. So after our validation and, um, and uh, calibration of those systems and determining the phenylalanine requirement, because we use phenylalanine as a tracer, we move to then measuring the amino acid requirements. And uh, I must have been really persuasive. I don't know how they actually let me do this. But when I chose to leave Mars Pet Care and go back to academia, Mars Pet Care let me take all of my data with me and publish it. I was a little bit persistent about it too, so there is that. But um, we have since then uh, published uh, six out of the, the ten, so we just don't have the branch chains, arginine and histidine published yet. Uh, the reason why we got no requirement for histidine or arginine, so I don't know how to place those yet in the literature, and the branch chains, I <clears throat> just haven't gotten the time to reanalyze the data. We've moved forward with every single amino acid requirement, and if you come to my talk on uh, Wednesday, you'll hear a little bit more about that. Uh, in the case of tryptophan, I just showed you the tryptophan requirement. I had a, a PhD student, uh, James Templeman, who took our ideas around tryptophan and he applied it to sporting dogs. And he came up and he thought there might be a benefit to gut health as well by simply supplementing tryptophan because of tryptophan utilizing bacteria in the gut. And so he took that and he put it into a clinical scenario and not only showed benefits of gut health, we also showed behavioral benefits of tryptophan supplementation and how long you need to supplement it to improve the excitability of the dogs on the gang lane right before they run. So if nobody knows anything about sled dogs, when you when they're fit too, they get so excited that they're gonna uh, that they're gonna go for a run. And when I say excited, I mean really pumped. And so as you put them on the gang line, they run in a herringbone formation. So you kind of put them on one at a time, and they all start yelling at each other and just bitching to each other and screaming. And there's always one dog that bosses every other one around. And this is the time where a musher is gonna get bit, right here. They're super, super excited. If you, if you handle them wrong, 
there is a much higher chance of injury. And so we showed that we actually decreased that agonistic behavior prior to run. But it's not just about these things that we like to do in terms of nutrition and clinical efficacy. We also have to think about what society is doing with a lot of the research that goes into product development and those products go into the market. And so this is an example of some work that we did after the DCM fiasco, where my student Sydney Banton did some surveys on um, how the grain, uh, the grain consuming uh, client chooses, uh, and globally. She also took that same survey data and she matched it so uh, she looked at the exercise differences in these dogs as well across the globe. And that was that German research that I uh, mentioned at the beginning where Germans are more active with their dogs. But I think that we have an even greater opportunity and we can go beyond this collaboration that I've already shown you. And I think that we really need to start to adopt an open science uh, format for companion animals because people want to know what we're doing in terms of research and data collection. And if we take an open science approach, I think it's the easiest way to get society and multi-disciplines into our work. And so that really means that you start with pre-registration, which means that you give society the opportunity to weigh in on the science that you're about to conduct. And you do it even more that you make sure that you talk about your conflicts and you're very transparent about it and you have the arguments that you need to have. You bring in adversarial collaborations, you need strong people, and then you replicate it to make sure that you're getting really accurate and, and precise work. But in pet food, uh, we have this little bit of a kind of a teeter-totter. I think it's coming around and I'm trying to push that as well. But we have an outsized role that's played by industry. And so industry has historically come in and kind of told us what the research is going to be. And there seems to be a little bit more flexibility now. And they're putting more basic work and they're putting additional outcomes into their work. And we have to be careful with them too, though, because the Mars Pet Cares of the World, as an example, they need IP. They're still trying to make money and beat their their competitors. And so we're going to have to weigh how we do this with industry very, very carefully. And I don't have an answer for how we're going to do that. But I think if we start thinking about an open science platform, that we can come to this with uh, at least part of the research and application that we do with the sector. This is one example. My PhD student, Lindsay Rummel, who was at Wilbur Ellis until August, um, she came back to the University of Guelph and she's doing a PhD supported uh, by NSERC and Protein Industries Canada. And she's, we're also collaborating with the Pulse Growers and with the Saskatchewan Food Industry Development Center to put through faba bean approval through the FDA and AFCO. And so we're coming to the FDA later this month uh, with our horribly detailed uh, protocol and all of our diet design and run information. This is our role in academia, but we can be that center plexus and we can bring in government and industry and NGOs. And we can also do it with a perspective that society gets to look at what we're doing. And so when we think about that schematic that I presented to you, I have funders over here that are really helping me get done the research that's needed. I have our flagship journals that are publishing the work so they can be seen by academia and industry, at least R&D and industry. And then in PET, we have a lot of conferences where we can get across and we can really communicate to science. And this is ticking up at an incredible rate. There are opportunities for my students to be completely all cost covered to go to present at AFIA, to present at Pet Food um, Forum every year, to come to Pet Food Association of Canada, which is kind of like the miniaturized, major, major miniaturized Pet Food Forum. Um, and so all of these are a great opportunity to form relationships and transfer all the knowledge that we have. But you need somebody like me. I'm an ENTJ, if you're all into Myers-Briggs. Uh, that's how I view myself. And I'm incredibly, you need someone energetic and positive 
because there's so many obstacles here that you could easily get trapped behind a wall and not be willing to climb it. And so you need people who are willing to have tough conversations, create a positive environment, and push, to, to push towards a single mission, which is to improve the health and well-being of us and our animals. Last but not least, because I am at a university, I've been talking about research and translation, but this goes beyond this. This is also the students that we teach. So how do we start incorporating the students in what we teach to make sure that they're successful in the industries that we send them. So one of the things that I did, uh, it was painful, but uh, with Champion Pet Foods, my tax, we wrote a $1.5 million grant to kickstart a, an internship program between the University of Guelph and Mars Pet Care. And we got it. And now my PhD students, so Taylor would be happy to talk to you because she's already gone on one internship to Champion Pet Foods. We're trying to make sure that you get both the graduate experience along with the industrial experience. They've been on the floor at, the, at, at a pet food manufacturing plant. They've been in the analytical lab. This is really widespread and we have opportunities to support that uh, in Canada with funding. But that's kind of, there's also this conundrum that we're all in that we also have a lot of international students. So right now I have a Bangladeshi student that can't come to the US to present any of her data, which is problematic for me because that's where we go. We go to American Animal Science in the companion animal section. So what did I do to counter that? Is I got this Global Link Research Award for her uh, from my tax, and uh, she's going to INRA for six uh, weeks to do mathematical modeling uh, with Yat van Melgen, who is probably one of the best metabolic mathematical modelers in the world. I want to go on the six-week internship, and I'm incredibly jealous. Um, and our students really want more and they want a plan and a rationale. And so we really have to structure a lot of our teaching around that ability to get them concrete experience, to allow them to reflect on that and change their learning pattern. And uh, I was uh, talking to Dr. Urschel last night. She's, she's doing reflections and everything that she does too. We need students to think about what they're learning how it applies to the academic parts that they're learning, to the applied parts that they're learning. That reflection is really important. It helps them then conceptualize, and then it helps them move into active experimentation. And so I think that opportunities abound in PET. I think that you have a crazy opportunity in front of you. And so spend a lot of time as you're getting ready your companion animal center, really thinking about what the short, medium, and long-term plans of that center are. And focus on your mission first, focus on who's gonna lead that ex in, into the future, Think about your areas of focus. Please don't do everything. That's when everything gets all muddled up and everybody doesn't have enough resources, which comes down to forming your team and making sure that your team has enough resources. And um, I, this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, we're using this to uh, try to really promote that it's not just us that want a repen of the NRC of dogs and cats that was done in 2004 and printed in 2006, but uh, Theo wants it too. So. <laughs> He knows there's a lot more information that could help the pet industry improve. And my last plug for the day, it was mentioned, the Pet Food Science Podcast. <clears throat> I'm one of uh, four hosts. Uh, these are some of uh, my most favorite podcasts that I did. Uh, Trevor Faber from Trout Nutrition, Hito Boss from Wagenigen, and Jennifer A. Dolph um, from ADM, uh, some of my favorites, but there's a lot of really great content on there and uh, from the other hosts as well, so I hope you check that out. And you're in ag, so don't worry. We, there's also swine, poultry, dairy, beef, um, and if you didn't know, Courses coming on the Wise and Tax uh, uh, platform as well. And so with that, thank you very much, and I look forward to chatting with all of you in the reception that comes after. Thank you.